1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father for Lord Jesus Christ, which, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptation, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, he loved, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Let's stop reading here. The last time I was reading that there's a major religion in, in the world who don't believe in the resurrection of Christ from the dead. They don't see it, they don't believe it. They say it's all conjecture, it never happened. And how sad that is because the whole gospel of the Bible is focused on Christ. The whole, the whole Bible is about the Lord Jesus Christ, both Old and New Testament. He is the centerpiece of the gospel. Without the resurrection of Christ from the dead, there would be no salvation. There would be no hope for any one of us who trusted in Christ. It's best that you eat, drink, and today, you, and then you die tomorrow, and, that, and that's the end of it. But the resurrection of Christ is very, 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 very important. Uh, you, can't, you read the Bible and you can't help but see it. You see it everywhere you read in the Bible. You, both the Old and New Testament, you see it everywhere in the Bible. And to deny that, then the saying goes, you don't have a leg to stand on. You don't have a salvation. You're yet in your sins and there's no hope for you. But if you read 1 Corinthians 15, let's turn over to 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, we're going to read in verse 1. Read this the last time, but let's read it again. It's so very important. It's so very important. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by the which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. God has written it to us. There's particular in the four, first, four gospels, and basically any place in the Bible you can see that great truth. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, according to the Bible. See, there's another passage in, in um, 1 John chapter 5, verse 10. There are those who don't trust the record, don't believe the record that God gave of his son. God wrote it. It's according to the Bible. We weren't there physically, but the Bible says it happened. And verse 5 says, And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen about five hundred brethren at once of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, that then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not me to be called an apostle, because he, I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so he believed. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that, that there is no resurrection of the dead? 
But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is your preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. And if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, but ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in, in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first of fruits of them that slept. And God goes on. So Christ did raise from the dead. And we know that, we have learned that, while he was on the cross, he wasn't paying for sins. It was a demonstration, but we know that Christ rose from the dead from the foundation of the world. You see, when Christ was on the mountain of transfiguration and Moses and Elijah appeared to him, they were talking about his coming death. It's a very important teaching in the Bible. And if you will look at um, Revelation 1, Revelation 1, to those who do believe that Christ this cross account is not so, then they have no, no salvation whatsoever. In Revelation 1 verse, I believe it's verse um, 18. Revelation 1 verse 18, I am he that liveth that was dead, which is speaking about Christ, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and death. So Christ was victorious over death and hell, you know, and, and these things. This, this guaranteed the fact that all those who, with Christ arose from the dead, even before the, from the foundation of the world, guarantees the fact that he will do what he says. The salvation of, the, of his elect is, is guaranteed. This is guaranteed that he will do what he says. But back over here in 1 Peter chapter, chapter 1, verse 4, and because of the resurrection of the the Lord Jesus Christ because he did what he said he would do it guarantees the fact that we're going to come into this inheritance which he has promised to all his his people all, his, all the elect of God but in order to have to receive an inheritance we know that there has to be a death someone has to die like when a human being writes a will you know the will cannot be executed until that person dies but even even in a human will, if I would die and leave my children a million dollars and they, they squandered it, and they could lose that inheritance, they could lose it. If they squandered what I, what I left for them, then they could lose it. But when it comes on to the inheritance that we've received through Christ, we can't lose that inheritance. It's an eternal inheritance that which is given to God's people because of Christ. It's nothing that we can do to earn it. If you look at Hebrews, let's turn to the book of Hebrews. I believe it's Hebrews chapter 9, I believe. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. Here we read, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience, from dead works to serve the living God. And says, verse 15 says, and for this cause he is the mediator of a new testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, which uh, uh, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance, is because of the death of Christ. And let's read verse 16. For where a testament, there must also be the necessity, be the death of the tester. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is no more strength at all while the tester liveth. So Christ had to die for that, that will that he has written to go into effect. And actually, it went into effect from the foundation of the world, really. 
because it guarantees that we will come into this inheritance. So Christ had to die for his promises and this will that he has written from the foundation of the world with all the names of all the, all the elect of God were written in this book, which is not a literal book, but God is using that example for book. All the names of all the elect throughout the history of the world who would ever come into existence are written in this book that God had from the foundation of the world. It's there, and we can't, it, we can't take it out. We can't erase it. Once God has written that person's name in this will, it can't be taken out. It's a guaranteed fact that they will receive this eternal inheritance, something that we will never, never, never lose. And how wonderful is that? And look at the promise that God has given to us, whether we live or die, nothing is going to separate from the love of God. And that's a wonderful promise only to the true believers, only to God's elect. The unsaved of the world don't have that, can stake claim to that inheritance. They're not there. But we don't, we don't know who they are, though. It's God's business, who the elect are, and who he has given this inheritance to. We know that the door to heaven now is closed and no one else is getting in. All those who are within this book, they are, they are saved now. And we're just waiting for the completion of that inheritance, if you want to say that. We're waiting for the last thing now that we're waiting for is for the true believers, the elect, those names who are in the will, to receive the other half of their salvation, which is our new bodies, and come into the new heaven and the new earth. What a blessing that is. And we can't even speak in the fathom that. We can't comprehend that. We can't imagine it. We can't draw a picture of it. We can't anything. But we know that it is true because it is God has written about it within the pages of the Bible. It's according to scriptures, according to God's word. And those of us who have had our spiritual eyes open, we trust the Bible without a doubt. Do we understand everything the Bible teaches? No. Humanly speaking, we can't understand everything the Bible says. The only the things that God has opened our understanding to, which he has given us understanding of, then we, we thank God for that. You know, we thank God for what he has given to us from the Bible. Uh, let's look at Philippians chapter 4. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 4. This is a beautiful inheritance that we've come into, and there's has nothing to do with something that we did or anything like that. It's only by the grace and mercy of Almighty God. So no matter how difficult we may have it in this life, just think of it. If God has truly given you eternal life, is this, our time in this life is very brief. It's very short. It's a moment. And if he has saved you and he's given to you this eternal inheritance in the new heaven and the earth, will we be thinking about how difficult we had it in this life? All the heartbreak, all the disappointments we had and, and all the illness that we suffered from? No, it will not come into mind. We, are in the, we will be in the presence of Almighty God and all our attention will be on him and we will be with him to all eternity. And you know, it has no end. Eternity has no end to it. And we can't even begin to, fa to fathom that. But the Bible has, has said it, that this, this is so. But in Philippians chapter 4, verses 3 to 5, it says, I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labor with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And let your moderation be, be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. See, there's a, there, there are the names there. There's a book that God has written, I said earlier, and all the names of all the elect are there. It was placed there by my, my almighty God. He has nothing to do with what we did we're there. And what the Bible says, we should rejoice because our names are written in this book. Rejoice. 
But Lord, I'm going through a difficult situation in this life. God says rejoice. It's only a momentary affliction. We're going to be misunderstood. And all these things is par for the course when you follow Christ, when you're in the true gospel. You're going to be treated as an outcast. And all these things will happen to the true believers. You know, maybe four or five hundred years ago, true believers were killed for standing for Christ. But thankful to God that in our land, that doesn't happen. Everyone will be killed, or you, you were born in a Mohammedan land where you can't talk about the gospel. But here in the United States, we're free to, to speak about these things openly and, and don't have to worry about persecution by other people. And no matter how it, bad it gets, we should rejoice, as the Bible says. Look at um, Revelation chapter 13. Here, all this will that God has written, the names of all the elect are there. Uh, Revelation 13 verses start reading at verse 6 and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names were not written so there are those people's names who are not written in this book. It's not there. Now, is that unfair that God didn't write the majority of the people's names who, are, who have ever lived on this earth, are, their names are not in this book? There's only uh, an elect few that is there. So there are those whose names are not written in the, in the Lamb's book of life, slain from the foundation of the world. So you see, when Christ was slain, from the foundation of the world. See, our names are written there because of what Christ has done. So if you refute the resurrection, then you don't have a leg to stand on. You don't have a gospel, you don't have anything. You see, it's based on Christ, what Christ has done on the cross, that's why our names are written there. You see, so then it goes on, in verse nine says, if any man have an ear, let him hear. And those who of us who have ears to hear, the one who God has given us spiritual ears to hear, we will hear. And uh, another passage, turn over to, uh, I think it's uh, Revelation 17, verse 8. The beast that thou sawest was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is so you see there again there are those whose names are not written there it's god's business whose names whose name is written there and we rejoice in god and we give him all the praise and glory if your name is there we rejoice in that what else else are you going to rejoice in god has given you eternal life this internal inheritance that no man can take from you because God has the power to know the Bible says in the book of John uh, somewhere in John that no one will be able to snatch us out of the hand of God we cannot lose that eternal inheritance because God will keep us he's the one that will keep us from 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 losing anything we can't lose salvation once he's given it to us it's a free gift of God the Bible says but see Back over in First Peter chapter one verse four, to an inheritance. You see, it's from if you read the last part of verse three, in in First Peter chapter one verse three, it says, uh, it says, uh, let's read verse three to pick up the context of First Peter chapter one. Blessed be the God and Father for Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. By the resurrection of Christ. See, see this is, that's the cue right there. By the resurrection of Christ. See, Christ, when he, died, he rose from the dead from the foundation of the world, it guarantees this eternal inheritance will come to his elect. So it's the, both, are, uh, both of it is, is joined together. The resurrection of Christ, what he did from the foundation of the world. That's why, as we know, that all the Old Testament believers could go into heaven because it was a guaranteed fact. The work has already been done. That's why Moses and all those 
true believers could go into heaven because Christ already had completed the work for them, for them that they could go into heaven. Enoch, Moses, Elijah, and all those Old Testament believers. So this is so because Christ already had done it. And, and we know because when Christ was on the cross, it was a demonstration. He wasn't suffering for sin. So you see, so this, by the resurrection of Christ from the dead, he has given to us this inheritance. And he goes on in verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible. Wow. Incorruptible. It's not based on anything. You see, the things in this world are corruptible. Our bodies are corruptible. At the end of the day, the Lord tires a little bit longer. What's going to happen to each and every one of us? Our bodies, you know, I could tell. <laughs> you know, my bodies fall apart already. If this Lord's mercy this year, I'd be 54 years old. And I, could, I could feel the arthritis coming in already, you know. I could feel it. You know, our bodies are corruptible. At the end of the day, we go back to the ground. Our body perishes. So this inheritance is not a corruptible thing. It's an eternal inheritance. Wow. Now try to wrap your mind around that. It's not corruptible. It's not of this life. It has nothing to do with this world because we know that when the Lord Jesus come on the last day, this world is going to be destroyed. So it can't be all this. You see, the unsaved of the world, since this is all they're going to get, corruptible things, money and their whatever they have, these things are corrupt. They're going to lose it. All this is going to be taken from the unsaved. This world is going to be taken from them. It's going to be burnt up. And when God created this new heaven and new earth, then it's going to be given to the rightful people who have promised to the true, true believers. It's going to be given to them, this new heaven and new earth, which is going to be eternal. So everything you see in this life is, is, is corruptible. Your favorite gift or your favorite this or that is corruptible. At the end of the day, you die, you leave it all behind. And your family members might fight over it, <laughs> or you leave it to charity or whatever the case might be. Really, you look at these, you have to look at these things. You know, true believers see the, the utter vanity of this, these things. Yeah, we live in this world, we need a roof over our head, we need a job and all these things, but we ought to be like, which one of those uh, in uh, Hebrews 11 who's, who were looking for a city? Was it Abraham or Moses? I think it's one of them. And we, are, we should have the same mindset. We're looking for a city whose builder and maker is God, the heavenly city. That's where our attention ought to be at. Not only things of this life, which is meaningless. These things of this life is utter meaningless. It's, it has no value to it. So it doesn't make a difference really uh, where you live at, what kind of work you do. It doesn't mean anything. The thing that we should have our attention on is eternal things, spiritual things. This eternal inheritance here that God has given to us, and that's where our mind ought to be. That's where the true believer's mindset is, you see. So in the meantime, we, we just wait on the Lord to, um, to do what he says, to do what he says, you see. So we just wait patiently upon the Lord. I believe we're in a time now where we're being tested by God, and we wait. Wait upon the Lord. He will, he will bring it to pass. He will, he will bring all this to, its, to the end in his time. So we patiently wait upon the Lord. And he will bring these things to pass. Um, let's look at another passage about this inheritance as we have in Ephesians chapter 1. I believe it's Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, God speaks a little bit more about this inheritance here that we, uh, that we have co co come into. Uh, let me get there. Ephesians chapter 1. Remember I said... Our inheritance hinges on what Christ has done. I should have read these verses earlier, but let me read them now. But Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. And who is that? In whom? It's in Christ. We obtain this inheritance being predestinated. Predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So this inheritance was predetermined by God for all his elect. Uh, let's look at another passage. I think it's in Colossians. Colossians chapter 
1, verse 9, verse 9 to 14. Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 to 14. For this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. You see how we have to live out our lives in this world? This is please God. You see, it says, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So you see, there's going to be an increase in the knowledge of God. And when you tie this into Daniel chapter 12, knowledge shall be increased. See, so there's going to be an increase for the true believers about God's salvation plan. And you know that we're living in a day where God has go. Oh, our knowledge has been increased exponentially about God's word. He tells us it's in knowledge, and he says, and the increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with godliness. And he goes on, read on a little bit further. Verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. So Christ is the one who makes us fit to be partakers of this inheritance, and the light is Christ, you see. And it goes on, verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, which is Christ, who delivered us from the power of darkness, and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And God goes on. See, all this inheritance that we was reading about in First Peter chapter 1, verse 4, is all tied up with Christ. Without him, there would be no hope, no salvation. And by his resurrection, he guarantees this wonderful inheritance that we've come into. And, and uh, it goes on in First Peter, say this, in, this inheritance is, is incorruptible. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6. In Matthew chapter 6. And, you know, the Bible has a great deal to say about this wonderful inheritance that we've come into. And this only, not even begin to scratch the, the surface of it. And, you know, the, 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 the future for the true believers can never be brighter. Can never be brighter than this because God has guaranteed this for us that we have come into. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Start reading at verse 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. So our treasure is not in this life. It's not here. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your, your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore the eye be single, the whole body shall be full of, full of light. And God goes on. So our treasure that we have is not on this life where the Bible says thieves break through and steal and, and it does corrupt. Our inheritance is incorruptible. It's in heaven where God is, where no man can touch it. And it's kept by the power of God, the Bible says. This is inheritance we have. And you see how, how God goes overboard to tell us about this beautiful inheritance that we have come into? And, you know, wonderfully, we had nothing to do with it. It's all of it is a gift of God. And let's look at um, another passage where God speaks about that. In Second Corinthians, in Second Corinthians chapter, Second Corinthians chapter 4, start reading at verse 14 to the end. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 14 to 18. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us, present us with you. I think this had to go back to all the true believers. It even goes back to the Old Testament. I, I could be incorrect about this, but let me read it again. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us 
also by Jesus Christ and shall, and, and shall present us with you. So he's like all of us at the same time is going to be presented before God on that last day. All the true believers in our salvation will be com completed. For all things are for your sakes. So you know what Christ went through is for our sake. And he came under the wrath of God that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. And all of this is being done for the glory of God. That's it. All, the, all of this is working out to the glory of God. And it goes on, verse 16, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, our light tribulations, it's very light, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not on the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. It's corruptible, you see. But the things which are not seen are eternal. See, so we, we, you know, we take our eyes off of this momentary affliction, this very, we're on this moment, light compared to eternity. It's only about a moment in time. We're here. And then either by death or the Lord comes on the clouds of glory. And there we are with him. So we have to get our, our, our you know, those of us who have had our spiritual eyes open, we understand this. Not because of our own understanding, because God has given us an understanding of these things. That this life is, is very is a temporary thing, and we're but here but for a moment, a moment in time. So let's look at another passage in Psalm 73. In Psalm 73, verse 25 and 26, here we read, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. Can you say this? That the only one on earth you desire is the Lord Jesus Christ and to be with him. Let's see. And it says, My flesh and my heart faileth, which it will, <laughs> if the Lord tarries, it will, it, it will die. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion, my inheritance, forever. See, God is our portion. The word portion, they could be used as inheritance. He's our inheritance. He is our exceeding great reward, as it says to Abraham back in Genesis. And that's one that we have our eyes at. And it goes on, verse 27 says, For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Who are the ones that are far from God, the unsaved? They're far from him. They will perish. Uh, shall perish. Thou hast destroyed them that go a-whoring from thee. It's already, like, as if he's already been done. The unsaved, they've been de they're destroyed. But not literally yet, but on that last, last day of this world existence, they will be destroyed forever. And he goes on, verse 28, But it's good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God, that I may declare all thy works. See how wonderful it is for the true believers. And you see the same thing over there in Psalm, go over in Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 57, I believe. It's the same word portion there. Thou art my portion, O Jehovah. He's our portion. He's our inheritance. You see, thou art my inheritance, O Jehovah. I have said I would keep thy words. God is our portion. We've come into the most wonderful inheritance. We can't even begin to imagine it. We can't. We're, we're humans. And I think throughout eternity in the new heaven and new earth, we're going, to even, we're going to always be learning more about him throughout all eternity because God is an infinite being. He inhabits eternity. And there, so we've got to keep our, put our eyes there. You know, and, that's, and those of us who have, a, have, have our spiritual eyes open, our eyes up, is upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, we have to live out our lives in this world and all that, in, that entails and but our hearts are with Christ. 
Uh, but back over in First Peter chapter 1, verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, for the elect. It fades not away, it's eternal. It's, it's, it's an eternal thing. And it, God says it is reserved in heaven for you. But I think I better stop here and next time we get into these other verses. And it, verse 5 says, who this inheritance is speaking about, in verse 5 in First Peter chapter 1, who are kept by the power of God. This, this inheritance is kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. The last time. And in verse 6 says, wherein he greatly rejoiced. There ought to be a rejoicing in this inheritance that God has given to us. It's a rejoicing in the true believer's heart because we know this is so. This is a fact. We've come into the greatest thing ever, you see. We are in you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness to manifold temptation. We've been tried. We've been tested. But we know these things are light afflictions, this temporary thing that we're here. We wait. We wait upon the Lord. Look, look at Brother Camping. Uh, he's been waiting for what? How, how was ninety-two years, and now he's in glory with the Lord. But yet, the salvation is not completed yet, because he haven't received the new resurrected bodies as, as yet. You see, so if you compare his ninety-two years, it's like wow, that's a long time. Humanly speaking, it is a long time, but compared ninety-two years to eternity, and who knows? Lord willing, next year might be. The completion of, of all this. Some of us who are saved, some are 10 years old, some are 20. They haven't lived to see a ripe old age of 92. But God is in charge, so we wait upon him. Let, let, let's pray. Heavenly Father, once again, O oh Lord, we thank you for this wonderful inheritance that you have given through to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And O oh Lord, we could, we could just sit down here and just just get lost in that. And oh Lord, we rejoice in the fact that you have, you have given us this wonderful inheritance. And oh Lord, we pray that only a pity that mankind in his rebellion cannot see such a wonderful gift. But oh Lord, we thank you for those who you have chosen, for those whom you have given, to, given this gift to, and for all of us here who were truly saved have come into the wonderful blessing of this eternal inheritance which you have given to us. Father, we pray for Chris as he comes up to do, to do the question and answer and his study. We pray for Guy as he does his study. We pray for the hymn sing. We pray for all the activities of this day. We pray for all those who are listening over the phone and over the internet and those who are, of us are here. Once again, O oh Lord, we thank you for bringing us through this past week to fellowship here together around thy word. And O oh Lord, we pray we ask as we go back to our homes, we ask for traveling mercies. And could it be thy will, O Lord, to bring us here once again to fellowship together around thy word? May all praise and glory go to thee. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.